All right, I see folks are still trickling in, but hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're calling in from. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join our Hepatitis Awareness Month Coffee Hour. It is May 5th and officially Hepatitis Awareness Month, so we know it's not just today, but the entirety of the month, so we thought that the first week of the month we'd get a kickstart on, on how to celebrate and what things that we can put into action for the month. So thank you for joining us. We're in good company, great content, and of course, a much needed beverage. So if I may, I do have my coffee mug in hand. Full disclosure though, it does have tea in it. So I will be sipping some tea throughout this coffee hour. Um, and I'm joined from, or with my uh, dear colleague, Catherine Freeland. So do you care to tell us what you're sipping on? Sure, hey everybody. Um, happy to see everyone for this Hepatitis Awareness Month and Cinco de Mayo and uh, API Heritage Month. So we have a lot to celebrate today. So excited to see uh, familiar faces. I am sipping on just seltzer water. I don't have as cool a mug as you, unfortunately, Jasmine, but i um, happy to see everybody and welcome. All good. I'm sure we have different mugs and glasses or even snacks in hand. So um, NASDAQ and Happy United, we're co-hosting this coffee hour. Uh, we, I think, can all agree that right now some of us might be webinared out. Uh, so we did want to Excuse me, I think I'm muted, unmuted. So from being webinared out to creating a space that's more engaging, uh, a bit more informal, totally relaxed. So I wanna encourage you to kick up your feet, but definitely still, hopefully the fingers are on the keyboard so we can have an interactive chat box. Uh, I wanna start off with um, welcoming you again, but also introducing yourself in the chat box. Some warm hellos are welcome, the sense of connectedness, where you're joining from, what you're doing in the HEP space. Uh, we really wanna spend the hour soaking up some great stuff that our presenters have to offer, but also engagement from everybody that's joining the call. So with that, we might be tempted by the coffee that's on the screen. And we are going to start off with a poll, which is how do you like your coffee? And you can see some pictures here. You might be like, wait, 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 coffee's not my jam. You might like it Frappuccino style. So if we can launch that poll, we'll see what everybody on the call has to say about that. And I just want to confirm, do folks see a poll about how you like your coffee? We do some head nods or thumbs up or yeses. Okay. We're going to keep it open for a little bit. Quite honestly, I guess if I'm going to vote, I uh, do like my coffee just straight black, no sugar, no cream. Um, Catherine, are you a fan of coffee and how do you like yours? I like coffee all ways <laughs> and drink it throughout the day regularly. But it looks like a lot of black, like straight black uh, folks on the call today. So I admire that true uh, coffee. I, I saw someone was a coffee snob, so. <laughs> Not coming in the chat box. <laughs> Oh, we have an oat, will, oat milk bandwagon. We welcome you to this call as well. <laughs> All right. I think our coffee votes are probably in. So if we could share some of those results, let's see who we have on the call. Wow. Lots of just straight coffee folks. Okay. And Catherine, I actually can't see the results. So if oh, yeah. Yeah, so it looks like we have about 22% of people say just straight. 6% um, prefer the Frappuccino style, which, you know, that's like a yummy milkshake. Um, iced coffee with cream is about 14%. Uh, milk and sugar, the only way, 16%. Um, plenty of cream, no sugars, same, 16%. Um, and we have about 14% of people who do not like coffee, which, you know, that's okay too. Um, and then we have some others in the chat box. And I guess we're seeing like cold brew, nitro infused coming in. Um, I got some cappuccino, so some of the espresso stuff as well. All right. Well, regardless of what you're a fan of or what you have in hand or order at the coffee shop, welcome, welcome. 
So we're actually um, really in, er, encourage you to, if you have any burning questions right now or even throughout the call, you can type them into the chat box. We are going to address them as they come up in the chat, um, also with our presenters as they um, unmute and share their stuff. But hopefully if we don't answer them um, when you pose them in the chat box, we can uh, bring it full circle when we have the discussion at the end. So feel free to use that chat box. Okay, so moving into HEP 101, I know that this can mean a bunch of different things to different folks on the call. Maybe you're new to the HEP space and you're ready for the basics. Maybe you're a HEP advocate that's been doing this work for decades. And regardless, again, thank you for being here. Um, this hour is still for you. What our speakers have to share today, I, I know in one way or another, it's really gonna resonate. So because we're a fan of the interactive dialogue, we're gonna start with a, a poll question, another one. For everyone on the call, how many types of viral hepatitis have scientists identified to date? Good question. And again, Catherine, for whatever reason, I can't when results are shared. So if you wouldn't mind. Sure, I'm happy to report. Okay. We'll give it a few seconds for folks to answer. How many types of viral hepatitis have scientists identified to date? All right, we'll give it like three more seconds. It looks like almost 70% of people have voted. So cast your vote, everybody. All right, so it looks like um, the most common answer is five. Uh, about 67% of people thought that five types of viral hepatitis have been identified. 25% um, said eight and 8% 8 said three. So it looks like most people uh, were familiar. All right. Well, even if you knew that answer or didn't know, thank you for taking the poll. Um, there are five main hepatitis viruses. And as referenced by WHO, they're referred to as hepatitis A, B, C, D, and yes, there's an E, which I knew not too long ago. <laughs> in, um, in particular, again, WHO, the types B and C lead to chronic disease in hundreds of millions of people. And together, they're the most common cause of liver cirrhosis and cancer. So let's go to a, another HEP question. Which types of hepatitis or type of hepatitis can be prevented with a vaccine? Another good question. Cast your votes, everybody. And this might be a tricky one because it does say type or types of hepatitis that can be prevented with a vaccine. Yeah. All right, so we have about 75% of people voted, so 76, so that's pretty good. Um, so it looks like um, our most common answer was hepatitis A and B. About almost 90% people uh, felt that, that those are the two hepatitis that can be prevented from vaccine, and that's correct. Great job, everybody. You're so smart. Yes. And again, whether you knew or didn't know, that's what you're here for, right? So vaccination for hep A and B are most effective preventive measures against those viruses. So for now, uh, keep sipping your coffee, your tea, whatever you have in hand. Um, we are going to move forward with our HEP 101 presenters. And I'm going to ask both Lauren and Maureen to turn on their webcams. Uh, we have Lauren Sant, who's the Executive Director, Caring Ambassadors Program Incorporated. And we also have uh, Maureen Kamishki, the Social Media and Outreach Manager for HEP B Foundation. I see Maureen spotlighted, followed by Lauren. So thank you both for joining us. Um, I am going to invite you to tell us a little bit about yourself and the role that you play in the HEP space. Um, Lauren, I, I welcome you to introduce yourself first and please let me know when you're ready for some pictures up. Sure, uh, thank you for inviting me today. And um, in honor of Cinco de Mayo, I have a coffee cup made by a Mexican artist, Mara, and my favorite coffee cups, uh, I can buy them in Cozumel, uh, just a plug for Mexico. So um, I got into the HEP space in 1999 when my brother was diagnosed with hepatitis C and then found out that I had three family members with hepatitis C. The great news is, is they've all been cured and um, been doing this work ever since. So the Caring Ambassadors uh, has been doing advocacy and education in hepatitis C and lung cancer uh, since the 1999. 
And um, when you guys called me and asked me about this, it just reminded me of how far we've come. So um, we started in the interferon days um, where when my brother was diagnosed, he had about a 12% chance of responding to the drugs. And um, now everyone can be cured, which is just so fantastic. And um, have, even hepatitis awareness, um, you guys asked me, come, come do this about Hepatitis Awareness Month. And I was reminded back in early 2000, um, I was out in the garden and I got a phone call and my husband yells out to me, hey, the White House is on the phone. And I run in and I'm like, what? And I, and I answer the phone and they're like, well, you sent a request for Hepatitis Awareness Month and we can't accept that because we don't have any, there's too many awareness days and too many awareness months. So we can't accept Hepatitis Awareness Month. And, and that's really changed. And you know, we're really excited. And um, we have the, the pictures there of, of HHS and Hepatitis Awareness Month in the White House. It's the first time that um, that was formally recognized by an administration. Um, and so, you know, we were so proud. We had a testing day outside at HHS that day. Um, and we've come so far to have an elimination plan. We were just really excited. Um, but we've been doing education and advocacy for patients, um, again, for a really long time on our website. We do have a lot of tools for patients. Everything we do, we give away for free. So um, we have a great tool for patients called Discussion Point. They can go through and uh, click on different, uh, what they've gone through, their experiences with treatment, and then we'll print out the AASLD recommendations for them that they can then take to their doctors and discuss it. And then we also have free education for providers on harm reduction and education on the treatment of hepatitis C from diagnostics to cure. So um, I'm here to help and we are always here to answer questions for anyone and provide advocacy for everyone living with hepatitis. So thanks for inviting me. Thanks for being here, Lauren. Even if the White House called now, I'd be like, let me tell you everything about what hepatitis needs. So. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask Maureen just uh, uh, to do the same, a brief intro. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the role that you play in the HEP space, please. Thanks, thanks for having me today. I'm Maureen Kamishki, and I'm the patient engagement and consult specialist at the Hepatitis B Foundation. I've officially worked with the foundation for over 10 years, but I've been involved with them and volunteered for them for over 20 years. Um, I was introduced to them during a patient consult or a patient conference when we adopted our youngest daughter, Marin, uh, who came to us from China with Hep B. Um, unlike most kids, she was very sick. She was treated at 14 months with interferon and later with antivirals. And frankly, I've been passionate about Hep B ever since and the people that are impacted by it. I started and have grown the foundation social media and consult programs. Um, currently, my focus is primarily interfacing with people living in developing countries where, you know, Hep B is very prevalent. Um, many countries do not have any viral hepatitis programs in place at all and access, you know, there's very little access and equitable to equitable care and treatment is very limited. Um, you know, of course, even in the US, it's, it's truly a struggle. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Maureen and Lauren. So you both are talking about um, patient consults and um, you know whether this is internationally, domestically, or patient consults or provider one-on-ones. I am curious what's the most common question that you encounter specifically during these consults. You know, we are talking HEP 101, so our, if if you could uh, speak more to the most common question encountered, we'd like to hear more about that. So I, I think right now for hepatitis C, um, it's changed. It's changed dramatically since interferon. But today, the, the question I get is, how can I get treatment? And can I, how do I access it? And you know, what do I have to do to get through prior authorizations, et cetera, et cetera? It's really about access to therapy and not really believing that they are eligible for therapy. Um, we actually made a video about it uh, called The Time Is Now, um, and it's an animated video just telling people, look, forget the restrictions, go in, talk to your doctor, get treated. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big problem for people. They just don't believe that they can get treated. Yeah, 
Maureen, I think you might be on mute. Do you find the, the same for uh, the Hep B consults that you have? Well, for us, it's a little bit more complicated, I think. Um, there are a lot of, of tough questions. Um, Hep B is a challenging virus on many levels. There's a lot of questions. Um, I have a few favorite questions, I guess. You know, first off, the one of the most common ones is, you know, how can I get rid of this? How can I get this thing out of my body? So we tell them that there isn't a cure for Hep B, but there are good treatments to control and manage the virus. Um, there are often no symptoms for decades or until serious liver damage has occurred, which is why you know getting tested and knowing your status early is so important. Um, not everyone with chronic Hep B needs to be treated, uh, but seeing a knowledgeable provider is really important in order to avoid uh, liver disease progression and to reduce the risk of liver cancer. So really getting tested early, a thorough evaluation and regular monitoring because things can change is currently the key to success with chronic Hep B since we don't have a cure at this time. Um, I have plenty of other favorite questions. It's up to you how many you'd like to have. I'm happy to share more, but. Yeah, why don't you share one more and then we'll uh, talk more about what that looks like. Um, so, you know, no, like, as I was saying, knowing your status is really crucial. And there are three simple blood tests, you know, to, to get to learn if you have a current Hep B infection, have recovered from past infection, and whether or not you need to be vaccinated. Uh, these tests are HB, you know, surface antigen, core antibody total, and surface antibody. Uh, people testing surface antigen positive need to be linked to care. Uh, but there's also a real value in knowing if you recovered from a past infection, uh, since this information should be part of your health history in case there's ever a need for long-term immune suppressing drugs to treat cancer or immune system disorders. Uh, and of course, this, you know, this test also, these tests also tell you if you're vulnerable uh, and need to be vaccinated. Uh, we also get a ton of questions on the vaccine, you know, just on the vaccine schedule. Um, people want to, you know, there's the two dose and the three dose Hep B vaccine. Um, you know, the, the two dose Heplosat vaccine is given to a, adults over 18 at zero and one month. And then the three dose vaccine is given at zero, one and six months. Uh, keeping in mind that that time in between doses of the series is really the minimum intervals. And that's a very common question people ask. Um, you know, I'm, I went beyond a month or I went beyond six months. They wanna know if they have to restart the series and they don't. Um, so, you know, the goal is always to complete the vaccine series as soon as possible, but you don't need to restart the series. You need to ensure at least that those minimum intervals are met. Um, but, you know, you can check all of that on C with CDC resources and also our vaccine schedules um, as well. And just real quickly, I just wanted to note that a lot of pregnant women reach out to us uh, with Hep B. Um, they're very distraught learning about um, their infection. They, they're they're terrified they're gonna pass the virus on to their babies. And of course, you know, the nice thing about that is that we're able to tell them that if their baby is vaccinated uh, within 12 hours of birth, you know, in the, in the US, they get HBIG uh, as well. In other countries that may not be available, uh, we encourage them to um, get a viral load test to see if they have a really high viral load. Uh, and if they do, they can have, take antivirals in that last trimester uh, to reduce their risks, basically almost you know, to zero. Um, then we encourage them to follow up after birth at nine months or at the first annual checkup. And of course, you know, in the flurry of trying to make sure that the baby is being uh, you know, prop that's properly managed, you know, but we still have to remember about the mom. So we encourage her also to be linked to care, uh, you know, seeking the care of a knowledgeable provider um, since often they're newly diagnosed at this point. So. No, that's definitely necessary. I also feel like you just shared a lot where it's like, wait, so you just told me, you know, I need to get tested and then vaccinated and I am, you know, this pregnant person. And so I, I feel like there's a lot to soak in, especially if you're just finding out. Um, can you talk more to how each of your organizations, maybe, you know, in the next minute, how you all work to address any stigma or discrimination that comes with it? because you're just telling these folks and then they're like, wait, 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 A, I have to take all of that in. And then I also have to deal with any stigma and discrimination that, that I, I do deal with on the daily or because of my hepatitis status. So Lauren, do you wanna start with that one? Sure, um, you know, 
we we do it a couple of ways. Uh, first off, we we partnered with StoryCorps in Chicago, and we highlight patient stories and really uh, just get the message out there. I mean, one in fifty Americans has hepatitis C. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It was in our blood supply. It's everywhere. It's an infectious disease. You just shouldn't be ashamed, no matter how you got it. It's an infectious disease. You don't deserve it. You should be cured. And and we really straight up about it. But also when we do testing events. We are out in the open, we're in people's faces. We don't have private rooms. There's no privacy tent. We're, we're out there at music festivals and different areas, anywhere we can be, you know, just getting people tested and highlighting it. And a lot of people are just shocked um, when we do that, but it's the only way because we, it, it's so common that we just need to be out about it. And um, through storytelling and open testing, we really feel like, you know, just, pushing the, the envelope and always talking about it, always wearing t-shirts, um, you know, <laughs> being very open. <laughs> yes, way to represent. Like you said, just forward facing and being out there, being like, look, everybody should. And yeah. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Maureen, in, in your last minute, what, what would you have to say about that? Uh, well, we've, yeah, we've been involved with this for a long time because of course people around in the U.S. and around the world have been stigmatized forever and discriminated against due to their hep B. Uh, so we played a key role um, in ensuring that hepatitis B was covered under the Americans with Disability Act. Uh, we had the um, last, last year, we had a, a survey and interviewed US participants and international and US survey. And we led the, we had the virtual externally led patient focused development meeting, which really uh, you know, captured the, the lived experience of people living with chronic hep B. And then of course, we are, we have published and continue to publish and analyze and document the lived experience of hep B, uh, including the stigma, isolation and discrimination that people are facing. Um, and also uh, what we've done just recently, and we haven't officially launched it, but it is on one of the links, um, is that we've begun, uh, you know, officially tracking discrimination in the U.S. and abroad by um, we're going to formalize a process with our new discrimination registry, which Catherine, by the way, put together. And our goal is she's spearheading this. Um, so our goal is to really collect the, this data and highlight the problem areas, bring attention to this global issue, and ultimately bringing about positive change. Um, it, it's tough here, but I tell you, in other countries. It's unbelievably hard for people. They can't they can't work and support their families. They test surface antigen positive, and that's it. They can't work. They can't marry the people they want to marry. They can't work abroad. They're really um, they're really in trouble uh, just by testing hepatitis B positive. So we've got to change that. Yeah, and to Lauren's point in the chat box, and like to change that is always advocating at the state level, so you can eliminate discriminating practices in healthcare. Well. I feel like we could have our own coffee hour all about this, um, but thank you so much for sharing. We are going to um, transition to some DVH hepatitis materials and resources that folks on the call can use throughout the month. So we have Molly Dunham Freed who's going to take us through um, the DVH resources that they have to share. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Perfect. Good afternoon and happy Hepatitis Awareness Month. Thank you for the opportunity to share our resources. We hope you find them helpful in promoting hepatitis awareness this May and beyond. I'd like to take you on a brief tour of the available resources. The first step is to navigate to the CDC Hepatitis Awareness landing page. The URL is www.cdc.gov forward slash hepatitis forward slash awareness. From here, you can click the box titled Hepatitis Awareness Month. On this page, you will find links to the social media toolkit, Hepatitis Awareness Month resources page, Evergreen Viral Hepatitis Resources, and the ABCs of Viral Hepatitis article. Let's dive into the Hepatitis Awareness Month resources page. Here you can access the social media toolkit, live read radio PSA scripts, free posters and fact sheets for download or order, and another link to the viral hepatitis 
resources page. First, we will explore the social media toolkit. On this page, you can access sample tweets and posts to use on your organization's channels, along with several graphics to choose from. Simply select and copy the content you wish to use. Then scroll or utilize the navigation buttons here at the top to access the graphics. First, we have graphics sized for Twitter and Facebook, followed by graphics sized for Instagram. To save the graphics, right click on the graphic you wish to use, select save image as and place in a folder on your computer. This year, we are using the following hashtags, hashtag hepatitis, hashtag hepatitis awareness month and hashtag HepAware 2021. To navigate back to the Hepatitis Awareness Month resources page, select the back button in your web browser. Next, let's take a quick peek at the viral hepatitis resources page. On this page, you will find a list of resources we make available year round. You can search by audience and by hepatitity. Please feel free to explore, download, share, and link to any of the items on this page. As we make our way down the Hepatitis Awareness Month resources page, we have another link to the article titled ABCs of Viral Hepatitis, followed by a tool to promote ongoing testing and vaccination services. This is the link to see if your location is already registered, and this is the form to fill out to register your site. Additionally, we offer other resources you can promote, including the adult vaccine assessment tool and two free continuing education courses, hepatitis B online and hepatitis C online, followed by information on how to request a proclamation. Towards the bottom of this page, we have links to the No Hepatitis B campaign and the No More Hepatitis campaign where you can access additional material and YouTube videos by clicking on either title. To wrap up our tour of resources, we will navigate to the updated No Hepatitis B campaign social media content by selecting the No Hepatitis B link. The 2021 No Hepatitis B campaign just launched on May 1st, and we'd love your help supporting and promoting these messages for Asian Americans. To access the new social media content designed to share on your organization's platforms, select campaign materials in multiple languages from the left-hand navigation. At this time, we only have English language social media content, but we do have other materials in a range of languages that you can select from on the left-hand navigation and here at the buttons at the top of the page. On this page, you will find social media content and graphics for use during Awareness Month and beyond. We have messages for Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram ready for you to use. Click here or scroll to access the graphics. First, we have graphic size for Twitter, followed by graphic size for both Facebook and Instagram. To save the graphic, select and right click, save image as and place the image in a folder on your computer. Please add hashtag no hep B to your hepatitis B related social media posts. We hope you and your communities find these resources helpful. Thank you for helping us spread awareness about hepatitis. I will turn it back over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Molly. I also know that some of the uh, links that were mentioned from Molly and the resources were included in the chat box. Um, we do have a question. Do you have Hep C information translated into all the same languages as a Hep B campaign? And if you know that off the top of your head, great. If not, we can revert back towards the end of discussion. This is Hi. Carrie. I can oh, make sorry. it. Okay, do you, do you go want ahead, to Carrie. Uh, um, you can. 
Sure. Hi, this is Carrie Sapsis from CDC. Um, unfortunately, we do not. Uh, the campaign for hepatitis C at the moment is an all English language campaign, whereas the B campaign um, is not only in Asian languages, but has also been audience tested um, with those communities to ensure that it's culturally appropriate. But we do hope to expand the languages we offer content in in the future. Great. Thanks for sharing, Carrie. And yes, I think that is in high demand, so would be utilized. Um, and thanks again, Molly, for sharing. I know that some jurisdictions are already using these resources and they're very present on social media. Hepatitis Awareness Month represents. So for any folks on the line, if you're doing this or plan on doing this throughout the month of May, please feel free to include in the chat how you plan to use these tools and, and let other folks know because they might have an aha moment like, oh, I'm definitely going to do that for the month of May. So please feel free to share. All right, with that, let me screen share again. We are going to get into some hepatitis storytelling and I'm going to pass it over to Catherine. Great, thanks so much, Jasmine. Um, so we're gonna start out this uh, second section uh, with another polling question. Um, so the poll question is, uh, do you know someone who has had or is living with hepatitis B or C? Um, so if you could please uh, take a few minutes to complete that. Um, it looks like we have about 50% of the vote in. Just a reminder, we'll just give it a couple more seconds. All right, so it looks like we got 72% of the vote in and it looks like 71% of people actually do know someone with hepatitis B or C who has had or is currently living with um, and 29% of people do not. Um, so. We hope uh, that this next section will offer an opportunity for you to get to know them, um, people with lived experience. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome our two panelists for this section, uh, Peter and Karen. Um, they are spotlighted. I uh, just wanna make sure they're that. Okay, so um, Peter, I'd like to welcome you and invite you to introduce yourself first. I'll let you take it away. Oh, I think you're on mute. Let's just make sure you're there. We go. Hi, hi, Catherine. Uh, thank you for that, and uh, hello to everyone. And uh, my name is Peter, and I live in the uh, Phoenix area. And uh, yes, it is hot here in one side, though. And um, about 16 years ago, um, I was diagnosed with hepatitis B and uh, immediately placed on medication. Uh, probably had hepatitis B all my life since uh, childbirth, but uh, I did not know um, and, uh, until it, it was, uh, my wife was tested um, and uh, I was tested and then it turns out that I was positive. And um, life goes on um, and, and uh, speaking of awareness with hepatitis B, I didn't even know how serious it was. Uh, how dangerous it is, um, and uh, doctor told me to take medications, do lab work. I just followed directions, and life goes on. It, uh, so about three years ago, I had an acute liver failure um, due to cirrhosis uh, because I had a, a viral flare-up from the hepatitis B. And uh, this one Saturday afternoon, my wife noticed that my eyes were really yellow. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned some of the other symptoms that uh, could be an indication of the jaundice. And uh, she uh, immediately took me to the ER. So that was it. I walked in into the ER and, uh, and um, the, uh, the following Wednesday, my liver had failed completely and I was placed on life support. And a week or the, the, the following Sunday, I had a liver transplant. So this happened very quickly. So about one week where I walked into the ER, uh, the following uh, week, I had a new liver. And that was three years ago. And I am under a uh, hepatologist care right now. So I'm continuing to take the uh, Vemulidi or the 
the uh, medications for hepatitis C. I'm also taking um, every six months a uh, an HBIC uh, hepatitis C immunoglobulin um, infusion therapy. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, life is continuing to go on, but I'm more aware of hepatitis B now and what it can do and how dangerous it is. And, um, and uh, we really need to uh, know more about it, let everybody know more about it as much as possible and everyone should get tested and um, it'll save your life. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for being here, for sharing your story. And, you know, I think a lot of the people on the call couldn't agree more with you, the importance of awareness um, and really getting the word out there to the communities that are most at risk for hepatitis um, about, you know, how simple it is just to get tested and then to make sure you're in care and being monitored regularly. Um, but we're, we're so glad that you're here and you're joining us uh, today. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Karen. Uh, Karen, take it away. I will. Um, thank you for sharing your story, Peter. That was very moving. And my story was somewhat similar. I didn't know what hepatitis C was. And I had lived my life kind of in an athletic way. And I, I kind of prided myself on my nutritional capacity to like eat healthy foods and drink protein shakes. And so one day after cycling, when I got home that night, my feet were swollen double. And I thought, what is that about? But I didn't understand that I probably had brain fog due to hepatic encephalopathy because I thought I was fine and was planning for school to start that fall. I'm a high school teacher. And by the next day, I was so swollen, I literally could not get into my clothes. And also like you, Peter, my eyes were yellow and my skin had turned yellow. And what I thought was a stomach bug a few weeks prior where I was drinking a lot of uh, jello and red jello actually had turned out I, I was bleeding. So I went to my doctor that morning and uh, was sent to the, the hospital and I had so much brain fog. I literally, after the MRI, when they said to me, you need to stay, your doctor wants to admit you, you need a blood transfusion and there's something seriously wrong with your liver and your, your provider will come here to talk to you. And I was so whacked. I had, um, I think hepatic encephalopathy is the worst side effect you can have because you think you're coherent and you're not. And um, I told the nurse, I said, you need to pull the IV. I'll sign the paperwork. I've got to go to work. And I called my family. And so my daughter, of course, and some friends met me at the car in the parking lot because it took a while to get me out. And I had to go back in and face, it still breaks my heart to the ugly, sad reality that my liver had failed. And I, I mean, absolutely clueless. It just came out of the blue. And the next day uh, they done a, uh, they did a paracentesis of course, immediately that evening and started the blood transfusion. But the next day when the doctor walked in, he said, um, your liver's failed and you have end-stage cirrhosis. And he began to question me about, you know, drug use or alcoholism. And um, by that evening we had, there was, I, I didn't hear about the hepatitis C, exactly then. So then by later on that evening, they said, oh, you have hepatitis C virus and that's what's caused your liver failure. And by then my family had gathered and um, it was a really shocking and very frightening moment for us. Um, I mean, we were so ignorant that I had family members there that said, I'll donate my liver. And we just didn't know, we, we didn't have any information. And I'm so thankful to Lauren and, um, and Maureen. Thank you for the forerunners who were doing the work of getting education and awareness out before people knew, because I was able to go home then and log on. And my doctor was able to put me on some medications to reduce the ascites. And we began the process of biopsy. And um, I was given about six months to live if we weren't able to reverse it. And I got my MELD score down to seven. And by that time, um, thanks to all the noise you guys were making and uh, the advocacy workers, the new, the new drug was released and the FDA approved the first triple treatment with the, the uh, protease inhibitors. So I, I cured within, you know, I had a, the 48 week treatment and I was able to cure, but sadly um, I was back in the classroom. I was teaching full time and just gimping along with the MELD score of seven or eight, which means I was doing pretty good, but having surveillance every six months, I went in for one of my um, surveillance and they found a liver tumor. So the next, the next year of my life was spent, I got listed for a liver transplant 
and had uh, aggressive chemotherapy over uh, three or four different courses. And at the end of the year, I was able to get a liver transplant. During that time, I, um, you know, the advocacy work began as a teacher. I was so shocked at the lack of information that was available. So I started my, my I called it a baby blog. And I was so ignorant of, um, thankfully, I, I was ignorant about the disease. But as I learned, I wanted to inform others. And so the power of storytelling, I, I just have to glance at you again, Peter. And for all of you guys who have promoted the power of storytelling. So I put a blog on and I was so, so out of it. I literally, the title was vomiting blood with hepatitis C. And so I'm, I was kind of embarrassed about it, but I thought that's what happened to me. And that's how I began to um, meet many, many people in the hepatitis C community. And uh, I'm thankful for the support that I've had and through my medical providers and through the community. And um, our story is not always pretty, is it, Peter? But um, the conversations that we have in the storytelling, I believe is what helps to create that awareness where more people are informed and able to make informed decisions about getting tested and getting the proper treatment. Yeah, Thank definitely, you. definitely. Thanks, Karen. I, I couldn't agree more with the power of storytelling and really emphasizing that point. You know, we can sit here as public health people and talk about the statistics and the data, but, you know, it really doesn't get to those heartstrings or people have a hard time relating with that sometimes, I think. So I just want to thank you both for being here and for speaking out. I know that there is, Karen, you kind of touched on this a little bit. There is that stigma. There's sometimes that discrimination associated with hepatitis and being able to speak up, I think, is so uh, powerful and we certainly appreciate both of you for being here for being advocates um, you you both kind of touched on this um, the shock of being diagnosed um, and kind of not knowing what to do after that diagnosis um, and I wonder as the community uh, how can we better support you guys uh, who have that lived experience are there resources are there guys uh, get through of uh, going through liver transplant and liver tumors and all of the challenges that you've overcome. So um, I don't know, Peter, if, uh, if you don't mind, um, I'll start with you. Hi. Um, yes, correct. So when I was diagnosed, I, I absolutely didn't know what hepatitis C was. And, and maybe I should say why my liver fell. So three years, about five years ago, my liver started to fail because my, I stopped the medication. I stopped my hepatitis B medication under the directions of my doctor or the advice of my GI doctor. And I didn't question him. He's a doctor, he's my GI doctor. He's given me the medication for many years now. So I, I didn't know what that meant. If I stopped the medication, I was actually happy I stopped the medication. I'm, I need to take this every day. But a year or two years after that, that's when my liver fell. And it's important to be aware that, you know, how serious this virus is and there's medications that you can take. And the medications uh, is, at least to me, there's no side effects whatsoever. It's just, you take it every day, you take it every day, you take it every day. Um, and there's probably many days when I forget to take. I never thought about what that means, how that could impact my liver. So there's a lot of information that was not available that is right now. And I think that we need to make a great effort to uh, increase the awareness so a lot of people know more about hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Nelly, thank you so much, Peter. And Karen, did you have anything to add? Well, you know, so as uh, I, I use like connecting to compassionate care. And so that's kind of three C's that I try to, to ask people. Um, if we feel like someone's going to have compassion on us, we're more likely to tell you that if we're not in compliance with our meds. You know, if you're, um, and I'm speaking to the choir because I have, an, I have a feeling that these are really compassionate people who are surrounding us here today. But if that could just be, so I keep using C's, I'm using alliteration. If that could be more contagious, you know, just reminding people to get out of that judgment place and get out of that place of stigma and just offer compassionate care. And then people will feel more connected to each other as patients. And then also feel connected to those people who can provide us with those resources. Because if I feel judged, I'm gonna avoid you. 
I'm going to back off. I'm not going to want to talk to you about my stuff. And uh, I hear that a lot from patients. Um, and so I'm very thankful for those of you who are providing the compassionate care. But I think that's a big part of awareness is so you guys all need to cookie cutter yourself and duplicate yourself in the in the arena. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a great reminder. Thanks, thanks, Karen. Um, really, compassion, empathy, um, so important in this space. Um, we know that so many people are not aware of their infection and need to be tested for hepatitis B and C. Um, can you guys provide some suggestions on how you might um, encourage someone else to get tested who might be at risk? Uh, Peter, I know you mentioned in your story that, you know, your wife got tested. How did that come about? How did you encourage her um, to get that testing? Um, was there a physician that helped? Um, how can how can we do better at getting people tested? She was actually tested first and encouraged me to get tested. And the reason why she was tested is because um, she was living in Vietnam and um, it was uh, a, a prerequisite or preconditioning for a marriage a license uh, is for uh, her to get tested. So when she got tested, she was actually uh, tested positive. And with that, um, it was advised that I should also get tested. Um, so when we went to get, uh, so this, she was tested in Vietnam. And then when she came to the U.S., um, we both got tested in the U.S., and it turns out that she is actually negative, so it was actually a, a false test in Vietnam. Uh -huh. um, keep in mind, this was back in 2004, um, but I tested positive, and uh, so that's how that uh, we both got tested for hepatitis B. But uh, in terms of letting other people understand awareness and, and getting tested, I think the storytelling campaign is, is definitely a very good opportunity. Um, and, and then reaching out to, you know, I, I always keep on thinking that when every time I go to the Sonora Quest and I get my lab work, there's posters everywhere about diabetes and, and other, but I don't see anything for hepatitis B. And, and it's things like that, I think that uh, would be, um, Anything we can do to raise awareness, uh, let the general public know, um, the, even though the, the virus is, is very dangerous, but it, it can be easily managed. Thank you, Peter. And Karen, do you have anything to add? Well, you know, there's, you guys know, there's two ways that people are gonna get treated. Number one, they're going to um, hear about it, you know, in a public service announcement or through the radio or something. I was, I was doing a radio thing the other day and the, the gal who was interviewing me, she goes, oh my gosh, I'm a grandma. She said, I'm, I'm going to go because my granddaughter's graduating this year and I'm alive to be here. She goes, I'm going to go get tested. And I just think people, even baby boomers today still aren't aware, um, again, how deadly this disease can be. So, you know, people hear about it through public service announcement, or like you said, something on the doctors, but the other one is through doctors. And Lauren, you alluded to um, some of these guidelines coming from state to state. And I think doctors need to really align with the CDC's recommendations and everyone over the age of 18 needs to be tested one time for hepatitis C. I really think we could eliminate or reduce all of this. Yes, ask your mom to get tested. So I see that in the chat. I think, uh, yeah, ask everyone, ask, ask your family members, have you been tested? And my family immediately got tested after I you know, came up positive. So I think I, I would love to see more doctors just saying, hey, let's just run that hep B panel and hep C panel one time. Let's just do it. I'm thankful for the CDC recommending that and then you know, updating those guidelines as we've moved forward. I think that's saved a lot of lives. I agree, definitely. So, so making sure we have our providers on board, they are our champions and can do um, a lot of this testing work um, on the ground. So I completely agree. Um, and thank you again, both for being here. And I encourage you, um, all of our audience members, uh, if you have questions, we have, we're going to open it up to a larger question and answer portion. So please put those in the chat box and we'll be sure to ask them in the larger group. But I, again, just want to thank um, Karen and Peter for, for you guys sharing your story, speaking out and being such strong advocates for the viral hepatitis community. Thank you both. All right. All right.
Any questions that are going to come through the chat box? I actually saw something earlier. It was from Arthur. Um, he had included a document. So congratulations on your certificate. It looks like a bloodborne pathogens training course. But I was wondering, Arthur, if I may put you on the spot and you can unmute yourself to speak more to the course that you took and uh, its accessibility to folks on the call. Yes, I um, um, as part of the um, uh, part uh, 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 a um, employee of the Department of Health for for a number of years, and I got into um, uh, harm reduction. And uh, just as part of harm reduction, we get our testing, we get our uh, our uh, vaccines, and of course, bloodborne pathogen and so forth. But with harm reduction, so many of the clients that come in for needle exchange, um, uh, they are positive. And it's, uh, it's a ticking time bomb for them. And um, uh, the best we can do is to make sure, of course, first of all, that they, of course, stay safe with clean needles and so forth. But, but also, we make sure that they, they're on Medicaid and um, that they know they can get tested and they know they can get vaccinated. So that when something happens, they have a place to go, or um, at least they know at least they know who to call. Because for a lot of folks, um, the hepatitis B or C is only going to be an issue when it becomes um, a critical medical concern. Up to that time, they have a lot of other stuff going on. So we're lucky at the health office that we have the people coming back on a uh, on a weekly or perhaps monthly basis where we can see them and remind them, hey, anything happens, this is where you go. Yeah, I, th I think that's important. Uh, being able to connect people to resources, um, you know, we, we're kind of meeting people where they are um, and they might need something other than a hep B test. And so being able to provide those resources to people I think is so important. Um, and thinking about holistic public health, um, especially during the COVID pandemic that has, it, has been so important um, now more than ever. Um, I saw we did have a, a, a next question come in in the chat box, um, and I'm going to direct this question to Maureen because she's our Hep B expert. Uh, the question was, uh, why is there a cure for hepatitis C and not for hepatitis B? Maureen, um, if you could uh, teach us yeah. a little bit. <laughs> um, Hep B is a complicated virus. It's, uh, it's been around for more than 4,500 years. Um, so it's, 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 fairly, it's very well adapted. <clears throat> it's a DNA virus. Um, it's, um, it's very complicated. It's uh, one thing that makes it very much more challenging is that it actually integrates into the DNA of the liver cells. So that makes it really hard to eliminate, right? And there's also a piece of it that's related. To, so there's that piece, like you don't want to kill all the liver cells, right? Because they're all integrated with hep B. But then there are other pieces with the immune system too. I mean, it's become, it's very, um, I don't know, it's, a, it's quite clever in it. And the immune system, it, it spits out so much surface antigen that the immune system is able to just evade it, you know, just totally ignores it basically. So um, the immune system never really mounts, uh, you know, an adequate response to it in people with chronic hep B. Um, so that, that's the short answer. I mean, there's a lot more, they're, they're very different viruses, you know, people think, a, B, C, D, and E are all the same, but they're, they're all very different. They just all impact the liver, but this, that's the short answer for that. Right, definitely. And Maureen, one of the most common questions that I know we get from our consult, when is the cure coming? Can you speak to that? Some of that's been going on in the chat box as well. <laughs> if only, if only I knew. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's a question I probably get, you know, 15 times a day. Um, when is the cure coming? Um, I don't know. We have um, a lot of drugs that are entering, we have a number of um, candidates that are currently in development right now and they're getting ready to enter phase three. So that's basically about a three, three and a half year period if, if everything is perfect. Of course, with um, COVID that has not helped, right? Um, you know, people, you know, I think companies, you know, pharmaceutical companies were reluctant to just, you know, launch right into, um, you know, a critical part of their clinical trials, you know, the phase three trials 
uh, it's hard to recruit people. Um, so we hope to see something in you know, about five years. So what's interesting is there's, there's the cure, there's finding the cure and, you know, and more will come along as there are other things um, that are in development in earlier stages. So there'll be, there'll be more, it'll be like hep C, you know, well, there'll, there'll be an evolution of them. But the other piece is, is that it's not just, um, we have to be ready because like with hep C, it's going to be like this for B, you know, one day we're going to have the cure and then we're all going to throw our hands up and say, well, how was everybody going to get it? So, you know, we, we have to be prepared for that part too, you know, it has to be approved, has to be approved in all sorts of different countries. It's going to be a challenging cure, like the initial cures were for C. So right. it's going to take some work. Definitely. Thanks, Maureen. And then another question, um, and this is kind of related to access prevention. Um, thoughts on expanding hepatitis B vaccination administration into pharmacies, community pharmacies. Um, and I know this actually is happening on the ground in several locations, making things accessible. Vaccines already are possible. You can get them walk in at your community pharmacies. It's just a matter of making sure they're stocked. So if you're interested in getting vaccine uh, at your pharmacy, just call um, and they, they are able to vaccinate you on site. And they're actually integrating hep C testing at pharmacies now. And they're starting to think about doing um, hep B testing um, or referrals too. So there's there, pharmacies have um, all sorts of uh, possibilities and we just need to figure out how we can easily access them. I don't know if Maureen or anybody on the line has thoughts on that. The more in the mix, the merrier, as far as I'm concerned, I'm happy, you know, hep B gets a little bit complicated with some of the testing and yet, you know, it really isn't rocket science. You have that chart next to you, you can figure it out, but for whatever reason, it seems to be, seems there seem to be challenges, but absolutely, you know, I, I would welcome it. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, we did have a question about hepatitis E. I don't know if anybody knows or is familiar about that. Um, I, I can do that a little bit. Um, so there, there actually is a vaccine for hepatitis E. It's a Chinese vaccine. Um, it's more like hepatitis A. So it's, uh, you know, uh, food and more, you know, uh, oral fecal root, you know, food hygiene. It's, and it's more of an issue with undercooked pork and undercooked shellfish. So that seems, that seems to be the, the, tricky, the trickier part of it. There's also a, not a lot known about E. So there, there, there do seem to be situations where you know, it can become chronic and it seems to be a particular issue in women that are pregnant if they become e, hepatitis E positive. Great. Thanks, Maureen. Just checking the chat box. Did I miss something, Jasmine? Anything? I haven't seen other questions come through. And with that, I do believe we're at time. So um, if you do have questions, once you sign off, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we can, will always follow up whether we have the answer at the time or not, but we'll be circulating some of the resources that were included in the chat box, um, as well as the slides. And also this recording will be uploaded to uh, websites. So stay tuned for all of that. But it was great to have you on the call. If you still have a, a full coffee mug, I think we should cheers to Hepatitis Awareness Month. So if you will, cheers, cheers. Thank you everybody for joining. Thanks everybody. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.